Good evening, all. Uh, my name is Dr. Constant Peter. I'm a family medicine physician here at East and also focus on um, women's health issues. Uh, I've been here at the Florida Hospital campus for three years. I've been a physician since 2005 now. Um, all right, I'm loving Florida. So therefore, we'll go ahead with the lecture. So basically, breast cancer. Over the course of our lifetime, one in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Here in the state of Florida, there will be about 13,430 new cases of breast cancer diagnosed this year only, and 2,570 will die of this disease. Breast cancer is a cancer that starts in the breast tissue. There are two main types of breast cancer, ductal carcinoma, which starts in the ducts, which, is, which are the ducts that carry the milk from the breast to the nipple, and then we have lobular carcinoma, which starts in the breast itself, which produces the milk, the lobules which produces the milk. So basically, if you're looking at the diagram here, these are the lobules. So basically, if you have, um, if they say you have lobular carcinoma, so basically it's coming here from the lobules itself. And then basically, if you have ductal carcinoma, it's coming from the ducts going out into the nipple. Um, the risk factors for breast cancer. So basically, age and gender. Uh, most uh, advanced breast cancer is diagnosed in patients that are uh, over the age of 50, and 1 to 2 percent of men can also get breast cancer as well. Um, family history, of course, is a very strong risk factor. So if you have a mom or a sister who has had breast cancer, so your risk of having breast cancer is much higher as well. Um, the most common genes that are linked to breast cancer is basically the BRCA1 and 2 gene, but it's also linked as well to ovarian cancer as well. Um, our menstrual cycle is also is a risk factor for women with breast cancer. If you started having your period prior to the age of 12, that's a risk factor. And if you started menopause late after the age of 55, that's also a risk factor. Um, alcohol use, heavy alcohol use. So basically you're allowed to have one to two drinks per day, but more than that also increases your risk of breast cancer. Um, women who's never had any children have an increased risk of breast cancer. And if you've had uh, your first child after the age of 30, that also increases your risk as well. Um, in the 1940s and 60s, the DES, which is diestalbestrol, was used to prevent miscarriages. The women with it, between that time that received this drug has an increase, a, a very high risk of also developing breast cancer. Um, obesity as well is linked to breast cancer. Um, although the link is not well understood, but um, what is thought to be the case is basically the, the obesity, uh, the fat increases the estrogen, and so basically an increase in estrogen will increase the risk of the breast cancer as well. Um, radiation therapy as a child, let's say for instance, if you, had, you were a child and you had a tumor in your chest and you received radiation, and so therefore that increases your risk of breast cancer. Um, early breast cancer usually does not cause any symptoms. So basically as the cancer grows, the breast lump will have uneven edges and it's hard and, and usually does not hurt. So that's where basically our screening tool is um, where we have to do our breast exams. Um, you don't necessarily have to do a breast exam every week or every two weeks, but once a month. Doing a self-breast exam will basically let you know the, the texture of your breast, let you know what's new, what's not new, so that you're able to go back to your primary care doctor and say, well, you know, two months ago I didn't feel this lump, right now I have a new lump. Um, dampling of the skin, so basically behind the mask, you may have a dampling of the skin, so that basically is a, a, a flag that tells you that there's something that may be abnormal. Puckering of the skin that looks like the skin of an orange, that's what we call peau d'orange, is where the, there's dampling behind the, on the skin itself that's coming from the mask behind. Um, there is something called inflammation, um, inflammatory breast cancer. So on the breast, you basically have a redness on that area. And so it may look as if it's an infection, but that's a sign as well to come in to see your primary care doctor for them to take a look at that as well. Um, if you have any fluid coming from the nipple that may be bloody, that may be clear to yellow, green, that looks like pus, 
Those are flags to, call, uh, to make an appointment to see a primary care doctor for a breast exam. Um, in men, breast cancer will include a lump, and for them it will hurt because they don't, they don't have as much as a breast tissue as we do. Um, symptoms of advanced breast cancer. So patients with advanced breast cancer will have um, bone pain, can have breast pain because the, the mass has enlarged and is probably um, compressing on nerves to cause it to have the pain. Um, you may have ulceration of the skin, um, swelling of the lymph nodes underneath the arm. That's where you check underneath the arm when you're doing the breast exam to make sure you don't feel any lumps. Um, and also weight loss, because at that point, with an advanced stage breast cancer, you probably not, just don't have breast cancer in your breast. It may have already spread to other organs. Um, doing the physical exam, um, your primary care doctor will do an exam examination of your breast. Um, he or she will uh, also palpate underneath the arm, your neck and chest area to make sure that they don't feel any lump. Um, if a lump is found, then they basically will order a diagnostic mammography with an ultrasound. Um, once the, the ultrasound is done to basically categorize the lump to see whether it's, it's a solid lump or whether it's a cystic lump, with lump, whether there's fluid inside that lump. So once they do the diagnostic mammography and the ultrasound, if the lump is a hard lump and there's irregular borders to it, then at that point, you're a point um, you go to a breast biopsy. And here at Florida Hospital East, we have the Women's Health Pavilion, which is here at our campus. And we also have FRI at Waterford Lakes, where the digital mammography can be done, the um, ultrasounds can be done, and the breast biopsies can be done as well. Um, the new thing that we added into our uh, care here at East, we have a breast care coordinator. So from the time that you have the mammography, whether you're having a normal mammography or you found a lump, you are in contact with that breast care coordinator. So basically, if there's an abnormality, she basically follows through with you to the um, biopsies, to, the ultra, uh, to make the appointments for you for, with the hematology, to make the appointments with the surgeon as well. Um, if you have a normal um, mammography, that breast care coordinator is always there to always say, also answer questions that you may have about, you know, what are, your, what are your results, what is the density of the results when you get them and all that and all those things. Um, the other thing that we do have here at East, we have the ex expedited care with our multidisciplinary approach, which means after you see your primary care, you get to see Dr. Sarah George, who's the hematology oncologist, and then you get to see Dr. Shu, who's the surgeon as well. So you're not just left as, uh, as a patient to look for your hematology, you're not left to look for your surgeon. Basically, everything is taken care of by the breast care coordinator. And now I give it to Dr. Sarah George. Good evening. I'm Dr. Sarah George. I'm one of the medical oncologists here at uh, Florida Hospital East Orlando. I'm from Michigan originally, did my training at Wayne State University, went to Chicago for fellowship, and have been in Orlando since 2005 and have seen many wonderful changes happen here at Florida Hospital East since. So happy to be part of the Cancer Institute here since 2009. So today I'm gonna to talk about breast cancer, uh, diagnosis and treatment. And there'll be some overlap in between all our slides, but just some reinforcement for you folks. So some of the signs and symptoms as Dr. Constant Peter already eloquently spoke, um, include a breast lump um, that differs from the other breast. So I always encourage my patients when they feel something in their breast to feel the other breast as well to see if it's symmetric. Persistent swelling under the arms, skin changes, nipple changes. Some women have um, inverted nipples all of a sudden and, and so if that happens on one side that should be investigated as well or nipple discharge that's unexplained. Dr. Constant Peter uh, took a look at this as well, um, cross section of the breast, and here you see the lobules that make the milk, the ducts that bring them up through the nipple, um, and this is the cross section of one of those ducts. So we see how perfectly we have the lining of the cells on the outside and the inside of the duct as well. If you have lobular carcinoma and it's in situ, meaning um, it stays within the duct, uh, the lobule itself. Um, we see that the cells have changed from the last slide that we just saw, right? The, 
Um, the cells have changed in some ways, and we see that in here, when it becomes invasive, it spreads beyond the basement membrane, um, and it is a more aggressive um, type of cancer than it would be. This would be a stage zero. Here, if you have ductal carcinoma, um, compared to the first slide where we showed the duct, um, we see that the cells have changed as well. And here we see in ductal carcinoma, which has become invasive, the spreading of the cells beyond that basement membrane. Um, so how do we stage breast cancer? When patients come to me, they always want to know what stage am I, and that's a little more complicated than it sounds. So in addition to the type of breast cancer, we look to see how big is the breast cancer. For example, we talked about how it would be stage zero if it's not passed be beyond that basement membrane. We look to see, um, after we look at the size of the tumor, we look to see how many lymph nodes are involved. And then we look to see if it has spread beyond to distant sites of the body, um, far from the breast. And here we have a diagram, too, showing the stages of breast cancer as it spreads to the lymph nodes. Um, and uh, stage four is the most advanced form of breast cancer, where we see spread potentially to the lung, uh, the liver, bones, and other organs, including the brain. So what are things to look for as far as breast cancer? What are things that are favorable um, if the pathologist looks at the biopsy specimen? Well, certainly the smaller the tumor, the better. Um, the, the pathologists look at the grades of the tumor, meaning they look to see how aggressive is it under the microscope. And the lower the grade, um, the more favorable the, um, the outcomes as far as um, that goes. Um, we talked about lobular and ductal carcinoma because those are some of the more common forms. But we also see that there are more favorable histologic types such as tubular and medullary. Um, patients um, also have reports on their breast biopsy specimens when they have cancer to say whether or not they're positive for female hormones, estrogen or progesterone, and those are actually favorable prognostic factors as well. And we look to see how rapidly um, the tumor is dividing, and the lower the S phase, um, the less aggressive the tumor. So we know that there are things in life we can change, and there are some things we can't change. We talked a little bit about the risk factors, and we'll go into a little more detail now. Some of our risk factors are inflexible. We can't choose our gender or our age, our family history, but some may be lifestyle related. Um, so breast cancer is diagnosed 100 times more frequently in women than in men. But still, in 2014, it's projected that um, over 2,300 new cases of invasive breast cancer, cancer will be diagnosed. And of those, 430 men will die from breast cancer. We see that age plays a role, too. As you get older, we have an exponentially increased um, diagnosis of breast cancer um, in women over the age of 55. Genetics, we always talk about family history, and that is very important. However, hereditary cases only comprise about 5 to 10 percent of breast cancers. We see mutations sometimes. Families um, have mutations of breast cancers where um, we'll see tumor suppressor genes such as BRCA1 and BRCA2. We'll see tumor syndromes where you have gene mutations that predispose you to other kind of cancers such as skin tumors, gastric cancers, um, and other tumors as well. So BRCA1 and BRCA2 have been um, well publicized after Angelina Jolie, um, but they should be suspected in premenopausal young women who have this diagnosis. We see it more commonly in the Ashkenazi Jew population, and often multiple family members are affected. Um, genetic text testing is recommended, especially if there's a male breast cancer. And we see the um, astronomical uh, increase um, by age in the risk of developing breast cancer in patients who have the mutation for BRCA1, um, as well as other cancers, which we don't hear as much about. In BRCA2 mutations, there's also a risk of other malignancies, including GI, um, melanoma, and even early on state pro onset prostate cancers. So when do we do genetic testing? Well, if we know that 
a family member has a known family mutation, if you are of the right uh, racial makeup, the Ashkenazi Jews, and you have a personal history, males, um, certain GYN malignancies, or if you are very young with a personal history of breast cancer, or if you're um, less than or equal to 50, and you have um, high-risk situations, they recommend it, or if you have multiple primaries as well. So 85% um, of women with breast cancer don't have a family member involved, but um, if you do have one relative versus two relatives, you see your increased risk of developing the malignancy. Having your own history of breast cancer actually increases your risk of having breast cancer in the future. Have, if you've had a history of invasive breast cancer, you have a three to four time increased risk of developing cancer in the same or the other breast. Um, if you have precancerous conditions as well, um, even if this precancerous condition we talked about, um, the lobular carcinoma in situ, which is not considered a cancer as of yet, um, but it does convey a much increased risk. Menstrual history, Dr. Constant Peter um, talked about the longer the period of uninterrupted progestin, the higher your risk of breast cancer. So early onset menstruation, late onset menopause, your first child after the age of 30, but you can decrease your risk by um, prolonging breastfeeding actually. Hormone replacement therapy in the estrogen and progesterone family have been found to decrease the effectiveness of mammograms by increasing breast density. Um, although that does return to the risk of the general population after discontinuing the medication. Uh, alcohol use, believe it or not, can increase your risk of breast cancer. Two to five risk, uh, drinks per day can increase the risk of breast cancer one and a half times more than in the non-drinking population. Obesity can increase insulin levels and also increase estrogen production. Actually, a weight gain of 21 to 30 pounds after the age of 18 conveys a 40% increase in the breast cancer risk. So how do we treat breast cancer? Well, Dr. Chu is going to talk to you a little bit more about surgical options. I'm going to touch briefly on chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and endocrine therapy today. <clears throat> so I'll leave this up to Dr. Chu to take over. A lumpectomy, mastectomy, um, the lymph node assessment like we talked about for staging. But as from my perspective, I'll talk more about the chemotherapy. So when do we give chemotherapy? Not everybody with breast cancer needs chemotherapy. Um, we use chemotherapy sometimes if there's a larger lesion to shrink the lesion. Sometimes we'll use it after surgery if the patient has high risk disease or node positive disease, meaning if the lymph nodes are positive. Um, if the patient has widespread disease, we'll use it as well. Radiation therapy can be used. Now, how does chemotherapy and radiation therapy differ? Chemotherapy are drugs given either by mouth or by IV that go throughout the body that kill off some of these tumor cells. Radiation is kind of like a laser beam. It hones in on a certain area of the body. We use it if uh, patients had a lumpectomy to sterilize the breast or if the margins after the surgery has been done are positive, meaning if we see that there are tumor cells at the edges of um, what has been resected, if the lymph nodes are positive, or if a patient has spread of disease to their bone and they're having pain at those sites. What is endocrine therapy then? Well, that's kind of an anti-tumor effect, um, tamoxifen has been used, and we've probably all heard about that in patients who have in situ carcinomas or in premenopausal women, because it does restrict ovarian uh, function of estrogen as well and block that. Um, in postmenopausal women or in patients who have, uh, in postmenopausal women and patients who have um, widespread disease, we can also use um, non-steroidal aromatase inhibitors and other medications to control the estrogen flow of the body if the patient, again, is positive for estrogen. So this is a, used as a blockade term. We have other forms of targeted therapy. There's another thing called HER2 new that I didn't talk about. HER2 new is actually um, a protein that's overexpressed on the surface of some breast tumor cells. And we have targeted treatments for those that are good some newer ones are coming out every day. 
um, risk reduction strategies. We also, um, some women don't have a history personally of breast cancer, but they may have precancerous conditions. They may have had multiple breast biopsies. Go to your doctor. There's something called a Gale model where they can figure out what is your risk of developing breast cancer over the course of the next five years if you're at high risk then they may choose to put you, if you're premenopausal, on tamoxifen um, or postmenopausal on raloxifen, which are some of the um, treatments we have available to us. If you, have a, if you are a carrier of one of the gene mutations that we spoke about, sometimes um, mastectomies, as Angelina Jolie did, or um, abdominal hysterectomies are uh, recommended depending on the mutation itself. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Chu. I am uh, one of the uh, newest members of uh, Floor Hospital East, but I am not new to Floor Hospital. I received my, I did my uh, five-year specialized surgery training over at Florida Hospital South Downtown, and my relationship extends way beyond that to 32 years ago because I was born at Florida Hospital South. So I feel very fortunate to be able to come back and serve the community where I grew up. My office is just right next door. It's in the uh, sec second floor of our uh, surgery center. So we're all uh, very centrally located. <clears throat> Today we're gonna talk a little bit about the surgical management of breast cancer. Uh, we'll start off with uh, a, re a review of anatomy and some of this is review of review because we've already talked about it before. So when we talk about breast, we, talk about, we, uh, we divide it into four quadrants. The upper outer, upper inner, lower outer, and lower inner. And we, d and we uh, classify where our breast cancer is based on these locations. The breast is composed of about 15 to 20 uh, lo um, lobes, and each lobe is consist consists of several lobules. In addition, there are fibrous bands that give the uh, breast its architecture and uh, make it look like it does. <coughs> um, as um, with Dr. George and Dr. Constance Beers have kind of alluded to before, there are basically two structures in the breast. There's lo lobes, and the lobes empty into ducts, and the ducts empty into the nipple. And the two main types of breast cancer that we have are lobular breast cancer, which arise in the lobes of the breast cancer, and ductal breast cancer, which arises in the ducts of the breast cancer. The, um, there's also drainage of the uh, breast, and this is important um, for me as a surgeon because the drainage of the breast goes to what we call lymph nodes. And these lymph nodes are areas where the cancer will spread if the cancer has spread. So these are very important for us in terms of how we uh, classify um, uh, the degree of spread of breast cancer. The surgical treatment of breast cancer has actually changed in uh, several years and has changed very drastically in the last few years. I, uh, in the very beginning, if we look at surgical text, I, w I was tempted to show a picture of how we used to, used to treat breast cancer, but I th thought better of it because all of you would have run out the door because it is very, very morbid. Um, when we talk about um, uh, uh, the early treatments of breast cancer, we talked about Dr. Halstead and that kind of thing. And when they saw breast cancer, they didn't see breast cancer as we know it. Breast cancer back then would be a patient would come in with a very, very large mass. This has been going on for a very long time. And the only thing we could do is what we call palliative surgery or remove as much tissue as we can and the results were, were um, not, ve not very good. Well, there have been a lot of advances in the treatment of breast cancer um, from surgery and also from other modalities that have, um, that have uh, improved both outcome and the way we treat breast cancer in terms of the type of uh, surgery or the amount of surgery that you need. And these improvements are improved systemic chemotherapy. We have very good chemotherapy drugs, and they're getting even better, and that is uh, allowing, uh, allowing patients to live longer with, um, without cancer, and also increasing their overall survival. There's also the addition of radiation treatment. That's very important because um, this allows us to perform less surgery and also treat the breast without having to take so much of the breast tissue out, and we'll, um, we'll touch on that in a little bit. This is probably the most important thing, early diagnosis. Those of us that do this for a living know that it's patients who come in uh, with early stage breast cancer have a lot better outcome and they reap the most benefit from the types of advances we've had in breast cancer. Early diagnosis is so important. And it's so important that I'm gonna come back to this again at the end of the, end of the, uh, end of the talk. So <clears throat> what, when we talk about early diagnosis, we talk about mammograms. The a recommendation um, 
that we give, again, people who uh, do this for a living, is starting yearly mammograms at age 40. Um, if you have a first degree relative with diagnosed breast cancer, then you can start ma uh, getting mammograms earlier than that. Well, this is a mammogram of a typical patient that I see these days. This patient actually had no symptoms at all. Didn't have any masses, didn't, didn't feel anything, and uh, didn't have any pain, didn't have any nipple discharge, but she was very vigilant with her uh, mammograms. This isn't the first mammogram she had, but this is her annual mammogram. And what they found was a mass uh, um, in her, uh, on her mammogram in her breast. Well, after, when they find a mass, um, we have to get a diagnosis. So usually what happens is we get, a, uh, um, we get some of the tissue and we sample it. What happens is the radiologist use an uses an ultrasound and they, push, they uh, insert a needle into where the mass is and they take a sliver of tissue. After they take that sliver of tissue, they send it to the pathologist and they do specialized tests and they tell you what the mass is. First, is it malignant, meaning cancer, or is it not cancer, and then so forth. After they um, do the biopsy, the needle biopsy, they always leave a small clip, and it's very hard to see on this, uh, on this picture, but they always leave a small clip to tell you exactly where they biopsied so that it, if it does come back cancer, we know exactly where the cancer is. So at this stage, this patient um, did have a diagnosis of invasive cancer, and that's when she uh, got, um, got plugged into the uh, Florida Hospital Cancer Program, and that's where she saw me. The surgical treatment of breast cancer is basically two uh, modalities. Mastectomy, meaning removing all of the breast cancer, or um, excuse me, mastectomy meaning removing the breast cancer, but also removing the entire breast. Or breast conservation therapy, which is just removing a part of the breast that includes the cancer, not removing the whole breast. Um, let's talk a little bit about breast conservation therapy. So breast conservation therapy, yes, is removing a lump of tissue of your breast that has the cancer, but it's actually more than that. When we call it, when we think about breast conservation therapy, it's actually a bundled uh, treatment, not just surgery. Surgery, which is lumpectomy, removing a small portion of the breast, not all the breast, but we also sample the lymph nodes because we want to know if the, um, if the cancer has spread. And there are ways we, uh, there are different ways where we sample the lymph nodes. Initially, what we do is we do what's called sentinel lymph node biopsy, or remove not all the lymph nodes, but a select number of lymph nodes um, to test to see if there is cancer in, in those nodes. And then if there it happens to be cancer in those nodes, then what we do is remove all of the lymph nodes in, your, in the axilla or the armpit, and we um, see how, how, how much the cancer has spread. And radiation therapy. So this is actually a three-pronged approach. Surgery, which is our lumpectomy, lymph node staging, and also uh, radiation therapy. The reason why we use radiation therapy is this. Um, when we remove a lump of tissue with a breast cancer, well, we hope to remove all of the breast cancer. We can remove the portion that we see on the mammogram, and we can remove the portion that we can feel if it's a palpable mass, but cancer isn't always something you can feel or see. In fact, they're little cells, and they're so small that you can't see. So when we remove a lump of tissue, we are removing the majority of the cancer, but what really happens is that there are almost undoubtedly some cancer cells left in the breast in the area where we remove the cancer. So we apply radiation therapy to this area to so-called sterilize, sterilize the breast or to kill the remaining cancer cells. In large studies, we found that patients who just have lumpectomy and don't have radiation therapy, they don't do very well. They can't, the cancer comes back and their over, overall survival is actually um, uh, not that much improved. But when we add radiation therapy to the lumpectomy, we find that they have a dramatic improvement in both disease-free survival or how long they live without the cancer coming back and also overall survival. This is um, a picture from a textbook. It's not my patient, don't worry about it. It's, it's from the textbook. And this patient had breast conservation surgery. This patient had just a lump of tissue removed from the breast. Now, I'm not gonna tell you which breast they had it removed from because I don't know. They didn't, say, they didn't, they didn't um, put it in the caption, but I think that's the point. This patient had a very good outcome because we removed a portion of the, uh, of the uh, breast with the cancer to the point where we removed all of the cancer. And quite honestly, I'm a surgeon, I do this for a living. I can't tell which breast had the surgery. So this patient had a good outcome. So if our goal is to uh, for breast conservation surgery is to remove a lump of tissue that has the cancer, the question is how do we know where the cancer is? 
Well, we, for a very long time, since the 1970s, we used this method called wire localized excision, or very simply, the radiologist would put a wire through the breast tissue, and the tip of the wire would be where the clip is, where they biopsied it, and where they biopsied the cancer, and that's where the cancer is. For 45 years, the technology has been exactly the same. We're limited by our technology. This is all we had, so this is what we used. Well, there are some difficulties with using this method, but like I said, all we had. One of the difficulties is, as a surgeon, you don't necessarily know exactly where the tip of the wire is. Can you, if you can imagine when you're trying to remove a, uh, a lump of tissue and you're saying, well, I, I, the tip of the wire is where my cancer is, I don't have x-ray vision like Superman. I don't have you know, uh, the, the electronic goggles like Iron Man. I have to use so-called the force. I have, to, I have to look at the mammogram and use that as my guide. As you can imagine, it's very cumbersome, and sometimes uh, it's, um, it's difficult to do. What all that led to, using the wire again, that's all we had for 45 years, was we were taking a large number of people back to the operating room. And we're taking these people back to the operating room because when we remove the lump of tissue, we don't exactly know where the tip of the wire is. We don't exactly know where the cancer is. So undoubtedly, some of these patients, we don't end up removing all the cancer. In large studies, we find anywhere between 22 to 57 percent of patients have to go back to the operating room for a second surgery. And this is for cancer. And that, that's, a, that, that's a very difficult uh, uh, conversation to have to a patient, where I make an agreement. I say, I'm your surgeon. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to remove your cancer. And then we come back, and I see you in my office, and I say, we didn't accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. <clears throat> so because of that, we, were, we looked for some better ways to do this. We looked for ways that were better than the wire. One of the, uh, there are all sorts of ways that people have tried, but one of the ways that we um, at Florida Hospital have, uh, have been very excited about is the radioactive seed localized excision. This method started uh, at Mayo, Scottsdale, Mayo, Mayo Clinic in Scott, Scottsdale, and they had the same problems we had. We're taking up to a half of our patients back to sur uh, second surgery because we're not removing all the cancer. There has to be a better way. Well, using the, this is the method that we use now, the radioactive seed instead of the wire. And this is why it's so much better. We inject a, instead of putting a wire through the breast tissue, we, in we place a small radioactive seed about the uh, size of a grain of rice next to the cancer. Okay, that's very important because this allows us to find where the cancer is. These are um, uh, mammogram images after uh, we have placed the seed. You can see the seed is exactly right next to where the biopsy clip is, and the biopsy clip is exactly in the center of our cancer. <clears throat> the reason this is so powerful and so useful is that I can use the seed to tell me exactly where the cancer is. If you, if you guys ever been to the beach, you know, with a metal detector beach combing, same exact concept, a little more sophisticated equipment, but same exact concept. Well, I use a handheld Geiger counter, and I move it over the breast. The closer I am to the seed, the higher my, my, my counts or the higher the pitches. So if I'm over here, it'll go do, do, do. If I'm over really close, it goes do, 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 do. I can use that as my guide to see exactly where, my can where the uh, seed is and, and remove the, uh, the, uh, the cancer in total. This is what breast cancer looks like when we take it out. It just like, looks like regular tissue. Just take my word for it. I do this for a living. This is regular. It's hard to tell the difference between breast cancer and and uh, and regular tissue. We've I, we've put some stitches on here to to mark which the orientation. <clears throat> and then after we remove the cancer, we send it to the uh, radiologist to get an X-ray to confirm that we had have removed the cancer. So this hazy area out here is the cancer. Right in the middle, this is the clip where the um, radiologist did the biopsy with the ultrasound. Right next to the clip is the seed. Around the cancer, there's a rim of healthy tissue. This is the ideal excision. We want to remove the cancer with a rim of healthy tissue to maximize our chances of removing the entire cancer. Let me compare that picture with the, with the previous picture I put up. So again, we have the cancer, the seed, the biopsy clip, and a center of uh, normal tissue. <clears throat> It's a little hard to see here, but the tip of the wire is right here at the very edge of our specimen because we, didn't, we had a hard time knowing where the, uh, where the wire is. The biopsy clip, it's hard to see, is right here. The tip and the wire aren't exactly in the same place and by no means are they in the center. 
this patient had to go back for another surgery because we had, we had left the, um, there, we had left more cancer in than we should have, or that, that was ideal. So this patient had to have a re-excision. This patient had excision to negative margins, which is ideal. We were so excited about this that we decided to uh, write up our experience. So we uh, compared our experience using the wire, which is all we have uh, initially, and we compared that to our experience using the radioactive seed. We had very, very good experience, uh, uh, very good results. We decreased the number, this is at Florida Hospital, this, these are our numbers. We decreased the number of patients we were taking back for a second surgery by 75%. 75%. We, were, we found that we were taking over half of our patients back for a second surgery using the wire. Again, we were limited by our technology, but there's something better, the radioactive seed. So we went from taking over half of our patients back for a second surgery to 16% of our patients back for a second surgery, and for various reasons, but less, uh, less so for, um, for the fact that we didn't remove all the cancer. Kind of speaks for itself. <clears throat> So I, I want to talk a little bit about mastectomy because breast conservation surgery is, um, although it's, it's what we offer to most patients, some patients aren't candidates for breast conservation surgery. In these patients, we would offer them mastectomy. Mastectomy is removal of all of the breast tissue, and usually we also sample the lymph nodes as well. <clears throat> so instead of taking... A, a lump of tissue out, we remove the entire breast tissue, including the nipple. It's a much more extensive surgery, um, but for patients that are, that that, that uh, uh, for patients that can't undergo breast conservation surgery, this is the this is the option. The reasons why we would offer mastectomy as opposed to breast conservation surgery are if the primary breast cancer cannot be excised with a reasonable cosmetic result. If the breast cancer is very very large compared to the volume of breasts that the woman has, it doesn't make sense to remove just that portion and then remove a little, uh, leave a little sliver of, of breast tissue, in which case we would, just, we would recommend a total mastectomy. Also, um, and this is very generally speak, this is in the very general sense, that when we do a mastectomy, we remove all of the breast tissue, um, that avoids radiation therapy. That, because we're not leaving any breast tissue behind, we don't need to irradiate any breast tissue because we've removed it all, including the cancer. So for patients who can't tolerate radiation, mastectomy would be a option. Also carriers of gene mutations, such as BRCA that Dr. George talked about, those patients are at higher risk of having breast cancer. So even if they do have breast cancer in one breast, sometimes we do offer mastectomy, not only in that breast, but also the other breast, um, to lower their entire risk of having breast cancer. We find that mastectomy doesn't necessarily decrease your risk to zero. The reason is this, you, it, as hard as we try, we can't remove all the breast tissue. We remove the majority of it, but undoubtedly we leave some breast tissue behind, and that breast tissue has the potential to, harbor, uh, to, um, to, to have cancer uh, later down the line. And this is ultimately what it comes down to, patient choice. Some patients come in to me, they're very enthusiastic about breast conservation surgery. They want to have the least amount of surgery as possible, they want to keep their own breasts and have, a, uh, and have their own tissue. Patients who, um, and there are other, and there, on the other spectrum, there are patients who say, just take it all off. Give me the full Angelina, is what they say. Take, uh, uh, they want to remove all the breast tissue because they're worried that they, they have cancer now. They don't want to deal, even deal with it at the end. All these, these concerns are perfectly valid, and it's very patient-centered. And we have a very uh, frank conversation about what our goals are between the surgeon and the patient, and we come to a, um, a reasonable recommendation. When we talk about um, patients who we recommend mastectomy, we kind of um, talk about them in, in, in terms of the patients we rule out for breast conservation surgery. These are some well-known contraindications or reasons why patients would not be recommended to undergo breast conservation surgery. If there are two or more lesions in separate quadrants of the breast, we talked about the breast being divided into four different quadrants. Well, if, there's, if the patient has two different types of cancers or two um, lesions, one in the upper inner quadrant and one in the very far outer uh, lower quadrant, they're very far away. For, these, for this patient, I would recommend mastectomy because they're in two different quadrants. It just doesn't make sense to remove 
lump of tissue here and a lump of tissue here. It would be quite deforming and the uh, oncologic result or the result that we want to remove all the breast cancer would be compromised. If a patient does undergo breast conservation therapy and they, uh, and they have what we call positive margins or we find that we haven't removed all the breast cancer, usually what we do is we recommend a re-excision or taking the patient back and re removing a rim of tissue around where we perform that surgery. If we, that patient has gone to, uh, has had a re-excision already or has had multiple re-excisions, it would just, uh, we recommend undergoing mastectomy because there's only so many times that you can reasonably go back to the operating room for a re-excision. Also, if a patient is pregnant, um, that's a, a contraindication to radiation. So as we talked about, breast cancer, uh, co breast conservation surgery isn't just removing a lump, it's removing a lump, sampling lymph nodes, and radiation. You have to have radiation if you want to go through this process. For pregnant patients, we find that the dose of radiation we have is, um, is very toxic to the fetus, and uh, we don't have very good ways of shielding the baby uh, uh, from the radiation, so we don't recommend um, uh, breast conservation surgery for, for pregnant patients for that fact. There are, there are little subtleties where sometimes we can provide breast conservation surgery for, for pregnant patients, but generally speaking, pregnancy is a contraindication. Also, history of prior radiation. Um, it may sound, you know, kind of odd. Why would someone have radiation before? Well, if someone had uh, radiation to the chest, we uh, had some sort of uh, um, disease where they would need radiation to the chest. We think about lymphoma or sometimes, um, sometimes other kinds of malignancies where they've needed radiation to the chest before. The body doesn't do well with multiple doses of very high uh, doses of radiation. You have really bad results. So unfortunately, those patients, we um, would probably recommend mastectomy to um, avoid the, the toxic dose of radiation. So those were absolute contraindications. If, when you go talk to um, uh, your oncologist or your breast surgeon, radiation oncologist or, 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 or your doctor, those are the known reasons why patients would not have, uh, would not have breast conservation surgery. Those are hard no's. These are relative contraindications. These are reasons why we would kind of tap the brakes a little bit, not necessarily saying you can't have breast conservation surgery, but we're going to think about it a little bit more. These are absolute contraindications. I'm sorry, relative contraindications. History of scleroderma or systemic lupus erythematosus. That's a mouthful. What that means is connective tissue disease. The reason why um, we would maybe not recommend uh, uh, um, breast conservation surgery for these patients is that patients with connective tissue disease, um, their skin doesn't heal very well. And if you apply a large dose of radiation to the skin, they have really bad results with healing and that kind of thing. So we recommend against radiation, generally speaking. Also, a large tumor, a very large tumor, and a very small breast size. It just doesn't make sense to, again, remove a big lump of tumor and leave a little sliver of breast. We would, uh, recommend, um, we would recommend mastectomy because the results would be just cosmetically unacceptable. So again, just to review, mastectomy is, to re, is the removal of, bre of all breast tissue in the nipple areolar complex, and we also stage the lymph nodes just like we do with breast conservation surgery. We sample the lymph nodes with, uh, uh, that are the most likely to harbor the cancer, and if there is cancer in there, then we remove all of the lymph nodes in the axilla. These last few slides um, I want to bring up uh, because I kind of have an ax to grind. So there's been a lot of... Um, a lot of uh, talk in the press, Wall Street Journal, um, even in the Sentinel, New York Post, uh, I'm sorry, New York Times, and uh, about the changes in the recommendations of mammograms. When, when, when should women get mammograms? The, U the United States Preventative Services Task Force has changed their guidelines and uh, recommended that instead of getting your first mammogram at 40, if, you, if none of your family members have uh, breast cancer, to getting your first mammogram at age 50, and instead of getting them every year, you start getting it at, when you turn 50 every other year. Well, people who do this for a living and take care of breast cancer patients for a living know that there is a big difference in outcome when you see a, pa a patient who has early breast cancer versus patients who have very late or advanced breast cancer. Florida Hospital Cancer Institute and American Cancer Association does not agree with the United States Preventive Services Task Force guidelines for in, in, this, in this case. We recommend getting your first mammogram at age 40 and then yearly thereafter. And if you have a, uh, a family member with breast cancer, starting earlier than that. 
The reason is this. The earlier you catch breast cancer, the better your outcome. We have a lot of new techniques. Um, we have a lot of new techniques uh, that improve breast cancer outcome, but the patients who see the most benefit from these new techniques in terms of radiation, even the radioactive seed procedure, um, and uh, some of our uh, chemotherapy and endocrine drugs, those patients have early disease. The patients who present with big giant tumors that have been going on for a very long time, that have a very, um, very severe disease, there's not a lot we can, uh, uh, that we can provide for the patient in terms of um, improving their outcome uh, for disease-free survival. So for that simple fact, I do not, recommend, I do not agree with the, uh, with the uh, recommendation of getting mammograms age 50, start at age 40. The, uh, thank you guys again for coming tonight. The, I think the message here is that breast cancer is treatable and beatable. Breast cancer is not what it used to be. We're, we're uh, catching breast cancers earlier. We have better techniques at treating breast cancer. Um, and uh, early diagnosis is the key. This is the, uh, if you go to the Florida Hospital's website here, join the Pink Army, you don't even need a, um, a prescription for a mammogram. You just sign up, you can get your yearly mammogram, follow up with your, uh, with your primary doctor, you can follow up with Dr. George, Dr. Constant Peters, you can even follow up with a breast surgeon, as long as you, you follow up and get, get, uh, get your mammogram. Thank you very much.